Hello everyone and welcome to this week's OpenGL 3D game tutorial and this week we're going to be using our new post-processing pipeline to carry out a Gaussian blur. So blurring your entire game is perhaps not something that you were planning on doing, but the Gaussian blur is an extremely important component of many different post-processing pipelines that we're going to be covering in the coming weeks, such as the depth of field effect and the bloom effect, so it's important that we learn how to implement a Gaussian blur before we cover those other effects. Pretty much every type of blur involves averaging together areas of pixels on an image. So for example, let's take this image here and just pretend that all of these squares represent individual pixels of the image. To calculate the colour of any given pixel on the blurred image, we can average together the colours of all of the pixels around it on the original image. If you do this for each pixel, you'll end up with a blurred version of the original image. By changing the size of the area that you average together, you can change how blurred the output image is. So if you just use a small area, you'll only get a small amount of blur, and by sampling a bigger area, the output image will be more blurry. And obviously sampling just one pixel would give you no blur at all. The size of this area is known as the kernel size, and for this tutorial I'm going to be using an 11 by 11 kernel. In a very simple example of a blur, all of the pixels in the kernel would just be averaged together equally to find the output colour. However, in a Gaussian blur, the pixels in the kernel aren't all treated equally, and they each have their own weight to determine how much they affect the output colour. The pixels nearest the centre pixel that we're trying to calculate the colour for have the highest weight, and therefore have the biggest effect on the output colour, while the pixels further away are going to have less effect on the output colour, and so have lower weights. In order to optimise the performance when we're carrying out this blur, we're going to be hard coding these weights into the shaders so that they don't have to be calculated. In the description of this video I've put a link to this website here which can actually calculate the weights for us, so as you can see here it's calculated the weights for an 11 by 11 kernel for me, and these are the values that I'm going to be using in the shader code. So hopefully you remember from last time that our current post-processing pipeline looks something like this. We first render the scene to an FBO to get our starting image, and we then pass it through the contrast changer shader, which changes the contrast of the image and renders it onto a full screen quad on the screen. This week we're going to be adding two more stages to this pipeline. Firstly, we're going to be taking the image of the scene, and we're going to be passing it through a horizontal Gaussian blur shader, which will render it not to the screen, but to a quad on another FBO. We'll then take that horizontally blurred texture and pass it through a vertical Gaussian blur stage, which will render the fully blurred output onto another FBO, and then that texture will be rendered to the screen using the contrast changer stage, which will also, of course, alter the contrast of the image. So you might be wondering why we have to split the Gaussian blur into two stages. Surely it would just be easier to do it in one stage, and in the fragment shader we could simply sample an area of the texture, apply the weights, and then add all of the samples together to find the output colour. And this would indeed work absolutely fine, but if you have a look at this example here with a 7x7 kernel, you can see that it would require 49 texture samples per pixel. And we're even going to be using an 11 by 11 kernel, which would of course require 121 texture samples to calculate the colour of each pixel on the quad, and this obviously would not be very good for performance. Instead, we split the Gaussian blur into two stages. In the first stage, we calculate the output colour of a pixel by sampling around the pixel horizontally, again applying the weights and adding the colours of all the samples together to find the output colour of the pixel. If you do this for every pixel on the texture, you'll get a horizontal Gaussian blur, and with this 7x7 kernel example, that only required 7 texture samples per pixel. We then do another pass, but this time we start with this horizontally blurred texture, and this time we calculate the colour of each pixel based on the weighted average of the 7 samples around the pixel vertically. This will vertically blur the already horizontally blurred texture, giving us the same effect as a full Gaussian blur. And by splitting the blur into two stages, we only required a total of 14 texture samples per pixel, instead of 49, or for our 11 by 11 kernel size, we'll only need 22 samples instead of 121, which is obviously a significant optimization. So let's jump into the code, and the first thing that we have to do this week is unfortunately fix one of my mistakes. 
Luckily, it didn't make a difference last week because we only had one post-processing stage, but this week we're going to be using the image renderer to render a quad to another FBO, and I've realised that in the FBO's binds method, for some reason we're unbinding the current texture, which would mean that no texture would be bound when we render, so we just need to remove that line. Also, in the image renderer class, we need to set all of the constructors and the methods to public, because we're going to be putting our Gaussian blur stuff in a separate package. So, now that we're done fixing my mistakes, we can actually get started, and in the description of the video you'll find a download link to the Gaussian Blur package, which contains some code to help us get started this week, so go ahead and download that and put it in your source folder as always, and then refresh your project in Eclipse and have a look through the code. So, you can see here that we've got these two new post-processing stages, the horizontal blur and the vertical blur, and their corresponding shader programs. You'll notice that the horizontal blur and the vertical blur classes are basically exactly the same as the contrast changer class that we made last week, with the only difference being that these two post-processing stages need to render to another FBO rather than to the screen, so they take in the dimensions of the FBO that they're going to be rendering to, and they use this constructor for the image renderer, so that the image renderer creates a new FBO of that size, and it renders to that FBO when the render quad method is called. Also, you'll notice that we load up the width of the output FBO to the horizontal blur shader, and the height of the FBO to the vertical blur shader, because we're going to be needing them in our blur calculations. The shader programs for the horizontal and vertical blur stages are at the moment basically completely empty, and they actually both use the exact same fragment shader, which is why there's only one fragment shader here. So, all we need to do now is to implement the horizontal and vertical Gaussian blurs in the shader code. So, we'll start off in the horizontal blur vertex shader, and in here we need to calculate the texture coordinates that we're going to be using to sample the 11 pixels that are horizontally around any given pixel on the texture. So, the offsets for the samples for any given pixel are going to look like this, where P is the width of a pixel, and we're going to be adding these offsets to the usual texture coordinates to get the coordinates of the 11 samples. So the first thing that we need to do is to create an output array of VEC2s, which are going to be the 11 texture coordinates that we're going to be calculating, and we'll pass them to the fragment shader where they're going to be used to sample the texture. We also obviously need to calculate the width of a pixel in the texture coordinate system, seeing as that's what the offsets are based on, so that is going to be the full width of the image, which of course in texture coordinates has a width of 1, divided by the number of pixels that make up that width which is the width of the target FBO in pixels. So now that we have the width of a pixel, we can start to calculate the texture coordinates and fill up the array, and we're going to be doing this in a for loop. So we're going to loop between minus 5 and 5, for hopefully obvious reasons, and then we're going to do blur texture chords, and in here we're going to put i plus 5, because obviously the array indices go from 0 to 10, rather than from minus 5 to 5. We'll then set this to the original texture coordinates that we've always used in the past, plus a VEC2 offset, and that offset is going to be pixel size multiplied by i for the x component, and then for the y component it's just going to be 0, because our texture samples are all going to be horizontally offset from the original texture coordinates. And that will have filled up the array with all of the texture coordinates necessary for sampling the texture during the horizontal Gaussian blur. So next up we want to do pretty much the exact same thing in the vertical blur vertex shader, so again we need to have that output array of 11 texture coordinates, which are going to be these 11 offsets plus the original texture coordinates. We also need to calculate the height of a pixel, which is going to be 1 divided by the number of pixels, or the height of the target FBO, and then we can just paste in the same for loop from the horizontal blur shader, but we need to make the offset vertical, not horizontal this time, so the pixel size multiplied by i, that should be the y component of the offset, rather than the x component, and then the x component should just be 0. So that is it for the vertex shader, so let's now move into the fragment shader, which is the same for both of the blurs. So here we're going to need to take in the array of texture coordinates for the 11 samples around this pixel, and make sure that you use the exact same spelling for this invariable as you had for the out variable in the vertex shaders, 
And again, make sure that the two spellings that you had in the vertex shaders were the same as well, otherwise it won't work. Then we just need to sample this texture at each of these texture coordinates, multiply the sample colors by their relevant weights, and add them all to the output color. And that will all look something like this. As you can see, this is just sampling the texture at each of those texture coordinates in the array. It's then multiplying them with the weights, and I got those weights from the web page right here. And you can see that the pixels closest to the original texture coordinates have the largest weights, and the ones further away have much smaller weights. And then all of these just get added to the final output color for this pixel. So you can copy this down if you want, uh, but if you'd prefer, I've provided a link in the description where you can just copy and paste this. So we can now go into our post-processing class and we can add these two new stages into our post-processing pipeline. So we're obviously going to need a horizontal blur and a vertical blur stage, and we're going to initialize these two new stages in the init method here. And the constructors for these take in the width and the height of the FBO that we want to render to, and for now we're just going to set the width and the height to the same width and height of the display but later we're going to try out using different sized FBOs to see what effects that has on the blur. Next up, we need to remember to clean up these two new stages in the cleanup method. So we're just going to do hblur.cleanup and vblur.cleanup. And now we can add these two new stages to our post-processing pipeline in the do post-processing method. So the first stage is the horizontal blur stage, which blurs the image of the scene. Then we go into the vertical blur stage and that takes in the output of the horizontal blur stage and then the contrast changer takes in the output of the vertical blur stage and renders it to the screen. So if we go ahead and render that, you should be able to see something like this where your scene is now a little bit more blurry than it was before. So obviously the Gaussian blur is now working fine, but for most of the effects that we're going to be using, this amount of blur isn't really going to be enough, so we need to find a way of making the image even blurrier. One way would of course be to increase the size of the kernel, but that would involve rewriting a lot of the shader code, and if we wanted the image to be really blurry, we'd have to use a huge kernel, which would need loads of texture samples per pixel, and obviously wouldn't be very efficient. Luckily for us, there's actually a very easy way of increasing the blur, and it actually increases performance as well. Instead of the textures being the same size as the display, like they are now, we can scale them down to a much smaller size. That way, our 11x11 11 11 kernel takes up a much bigger portion of the texture, and so results in more blur. The smaller we make these textures, the blurrier the output will be. So in the code, let's now divide the dimensions of the FBOs that we're rendering to by 8, which will make them a lot smaller than the size of the display. And if we go ahead and run that, you can see that the output image is now a lot blurry. However, this doesn't come without its problems, and the most obvious problem is the flickering that you can see in the image, especially if you have a look at the trees. This is because of the downscaling of the texture for the blur stages, which led to the texture being much more pixelated. This is actually what the texture would look like if the blurring didn't take place, and so you can see quite clearly now where the flickering comes from. The blurring helps quite a lot to hide the flickering, but it's definitely still visible to some extent. Depending on what you need the blur for, this might not actually bother you, so you wouldn't need to fix it. But if you definitely need that top quality Gaussian blur, then one thing that you can do is to carry out multiple blur stages. So instead of downscaling the texture in one go to a tiny portion of the original texture, which introduces a whole load of aliasing, and then using that to blur, you instead scale it down a little bit, then blur that, then you scale it down a little bit more, carry out the Gaussian blur, and so on. The number of stages that you require just depends on how blurry you want that final image to be, and how high quality you want it to be. It is of course a bit more expensive than what we're doing at the moment, but it does get rid of the flickering and it's still a whole load more efficient than trying to blur the original full size texture with a huge kernel. So let's try this out quickly in the code. So we're going to need two new stages, one new horizontal blur and one new vertical blur, which I'll call hblur2 and vblur2. We need to remember to clean these up in the cleanup method, and then in the init method we need to initialize them both, and we're going to set the size of their FBOs to the size of the display divided by two. So it's not quite as small as hblur and vblur, uh, but it's still a bit smaller than the size of the display. 
Then the first thing that's going to happen is horizontal blur 2 is going to horizontally blur the image of the scene. Then vertical blur 2 is going to blur the output of horizontal blur 2. And then H blur needs to take in the output of V blur 2. And if we go ahead and run that, we should still get the same amount of blur, but it should now be a lot less flickery. And you can see that that is indeed the case. And again, it's totally dependent on the situation that you're using the blur as to whether you actually need to have those two extra blur stages. And for most of the things that we're going to be using the Gaussian blur for, we're actually not going to be needing those extra two stages. So we're just going to be having one horizontal blur and one vertical blur. So that is going to be it for this week. Next time we're going to be having a look at some more post-processing effects, possibly even the bloom shader effect. But yeah, thank you guys very much for watching this video. Do subscribe if you haven't already. Have a wonderful week and I will see you all next time.